if we could now turn to our uh, bulletins, our opening hymn and the candle lighting is Immortal, Invisible, Red Hymnal, number seven. Judge his people. 
Gather to me, my faithful ones, who make a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judged. Those who bring thanksgiving as a sacrifice honor me. To those who go the right way, I will show the salvation of God.
also through the Word of God and also in Holy Communion that we will shortly share. Lead us to a deeper faith through all of you, to a fuller trust and a greater willingness to serve you. May we hear your voice, answer your call, and serve where we are most needed. We are ready to share your promises, to claim our heritage as your called and chosen people, and to extend to all we need the invitation to share in the belief. May all people discern the treasure that you offer through worship, and help us to better appreciate the power of prayer by helping us to believe more deeply and really sincerely and meaningfully that all prayers are heard by you, and that every word we say to God, that it matters to God. In these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And now, let us share the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
and today's gospel is taken from Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. And Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms to the poor. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come, and he will serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known that the hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. So farmers around here, they, they've got nothing at all to worry for me. You know, some people are wonderful gardeners. They can plant and pick all sorts of vegetables and fruits all season long. I am not that person. I did plant four tomato plants. I did plant four pepper plants. Sharon loves her tomatoes, and I love my fried peppers. And early in the season, everything looked great and hopeful. I was getting all excited. Plus, for Father's Day this year, my, my two daughters got me a dwarf lemon tree. I love the smell of lemon blossoms. And the potted tree is growing very nicely on our back deck. It had blossoms, and it actually had lemons growing. And the summer, as you know, has been tough. It has been terribly hot, and it has been terribly dry. And so we're in this drought, and we have a heat index that's around 100 almost every day, and I'm wilting. But my little garden was doing fine because I could go out there since it's a little garden, and I could water, which meant that my tomatoes, my peppers, my lemons, they were all doing great, even though it was hot, even though it was dry. But the drought, it still got my little garden anyway. I think the squirrels who live in the woods around my house, they were really struggling to get anything to quench their thirst. And those son of a guns, they discovered my tomatoes and my peppers and my lemons. And so when they first started getting in there, I put out mothballs. And somebody told me mothballs didn't work. Nothing. I put out a couple of hollow scarecrows that I had laying around. They, they, no, they weren't scared at all by my scarecrows. And so they ate every single green tomato. They ate every one of my peppers. I never got a one. Sharon never got a one. They even came up on the deck and they had the nerve to eat my Father's Day lemons. And I'm happy, though, that I could help these little rodent neighbors of mine to score. I'm just so pleased that they're enjoying my vegetables and fruit instead of Sharon and me doing so. But no. No, I'm not. I'm really not happy. And I shared that story with my nature-loving self, where I'm not happy about giving some squirrel enough to drink. I'm not happy about that because I want to shed a little bit of light on Jesus' parable that I just finished reading. You know, um, it's summertime, so I get to read a little bit more, and Sharon and I will take a day trip every once in a while. We went out to Williamstown, and I like going to independent bookstores. I like to support them. And they got cheap, good books, too, you know, the used ones. And so I picked up Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence. And it's a novel about the ultra-wealthy who lived in New York City in the late 1800s, which was the world that Edith Wharton grew up in. And the only way that they could live that lifestyle that they had grown accustomed to was because they employed a house full of servants. But you know, in that whole book, the servants are never heard from, never seen, never acknowledged. The constant work they perform that is so needed because these rich people are absolutely useless and helpless, they can't do anything for themselves, those servants are ignored, they're taken for granted. And the thought is that what they do they're supposed to do that. You don't thank them for doing that. That's their job. They're paid for. They should be happy to be able to do it. And so they're ignored in plain sight. And that's the way it is with these paid servants. But Jesus is terrible today. It's not about paid servants. Jesus is telling us a story about slaves and their master, about people who are owned by someone else, actually owned by someone. 
And Jesus lays out the story of an unspectacular act of service on their part. The master comes home from a wedding. Big deal if it's at dusk. Big deal if it's at midnight. Big deal if it's closer to dawn. He comes home, and when he knocks at his door, a servant is there to open the door. This is an unspectacular act of service. And for this unextraordinary act, there is an extraordinary response on the, on the part of the master. And it, it is something that would never, ever have happened. It would never even have crossed the mind of anyone who was listening to Jesus that this was ever a possibility. In my feigned pleasure at being able to feed tomatoes and, and peppers and lemons to that squirrel, instead of to share the news, a dull reflection of how that master would never, ever, ever have been so overwhelmed by an ordinary act of service to the slaves that he would turn around and serve them. That's what the gospel story is about. The, he, the, the master asks the slaves to take the seat at table. He puts on the garb of the servant, and then the master feeds the slaves at his table with his food as he is doing their job. And I don't think any of us here are wealthy enough to have servants. And I know none of us here have slaves, and this imagery is a tad foreign to us, but would it, this would have been a common experience for the people who were listening to Jesus. And most all of them would have been listening from the perspective of maybe the servant or the slave, not from the master, not from the rich person. And they must have wondered to themselves, what kind of world is this that Jesus was talking about? And maybe then pleasantly surprised by the possibility that Jesus imagined. You know, they knew it was preposterous, this idea of the master putting on the slave's garb, telling the slave to sit at his seat and then feeding him his food. It would never, ever have happened. And they must have scratched their head wondering, what is Jesus talking about? And they must have left, maybe in little groups, talking amongst themselves. What is Jesus talking about? Then they put their head on the bed and, you know, gone to bed and think, what was Jesus talking about? And they woke it up and what was Jesus talking about? And when Jesus challenges us like that, when Jesus gets us to think again about things that we just accepted, that's when the gospel has its chance to, you know those earworm songs that once you hear them, you can't get it out of your head? When Jesus' gospel becomes an earworm message, it gets into our heads and it can't sneak out because we're wondering, what in the world is Jesus taking? What is Jesus on that he would come up with this kind of a message? And I don't think any of us here would be beyond being surprised by this idea of the master serving the servants. So they must have wondered what kind of world Jesus was talking about. They must have been pleasantly surprised by Jesus' imagined world. So Jesus is advocating for a new ordinary. And Jesus, it's not like Randy Calvo advocating for a new ordinary. This is Jesus saying there should be a new ordinary. For one, Jesus is revealing a new relationship with God. That old paradigm of master-slave for God and the faithful, Jesus is saying that doesn't work for me. You know, God doesn't want to have a relationship where you feel like he owns you. He wants you to have this feeling like he is, that you are loved by God. You know, that you know, my, my little flock, he says to us today, he wants us to know that God cares about us, that God doesn't own us and expect service only from us. God expects love from us because he loves us. And secondly, Jesus is only turning to the image of God on its head. Jesus is also asking us to envision a world that is turned on its head because we're turned on its head. And this is when faith gets to God. So the words that Christ have shared with us just a little while ago from Isaiah, they, they're harsh. They're really harsh words. God says, all of your worship, all of those sacrifices that you bring me, all of, you, know, you keep trampling my courts, it says, it's just a bother, it's just a nuisance, it's just a noise, because you come here, and you don't really acknowledge me, you don't change, and so God says they've become a burden to me, and I am weary of bearing your worship. Now this isn't only a condemnation of Jerusalem temple. This isn't only a condemnation of sacrifices in the Jewish priesthood. This is a condemnation of any kind of institutional worship that doesn't take worship seriously to the point where it can change us. And so, in Isaiah, there are powerful words from God to the prophet. And he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doing before my eyes. And then Isaiah continues, 
And that means this, cease to do evil. If you come here on Saturday, remember the Jewish temple, if you come here on Saturday, well, on Sunday, I want you to cease to do evil. On Monday, I want you to learn to do good. On Tuesday, I want you to seek justice. On Wednesday, I want you to rescue the oppressed. On Thursday, I want you to defend the orphan. On Friday, I want you to plead for the widow. What you do here on the Sabbath, it better have effect on the rest of the week, or you are just bothering me with your noise, God says. Not really, but God says. In other words, put your faith into practice to make a difference in the world. And that's a sign that this worship is meaningful. Remember that when Jesus reveals this new image of the master and the slave, it's in the context of us being prepared. So it's not just a new vision of God. It's are we prepared for that kind of God? Are we ready to worship that kind of God not only on Sunday, but also the rest of the week? A friend of mine posted this um, on Facebook. And it says, I'm so sick of seeing Christians in America claim persecution. You aren't being persecuted for loving Jesus. You are being held accountable for not acting like Jesus. It isn't easy to imitate Jesus. We're not in this alone. We have each other. We also have God. We have Jesus that walks with us. And we have Jesus who feeds us at table. So for as preposterous as it may have sounded, for the master to take off his guard and put on the servant's guard, to ask the slaves to sit down and he would serve them, think about this simple table here. Think about what this simple table cost Jesus. It cost his life on the cross. And so when Jesus comes and asks us to sit down at his table, and he serves us this meal, his body, his blood, you may have thought it was preposterous in the parable, but that's the spiritual food that we share right now and we celebrate in this miracle, this mystery, and this holy communion. May this feed our souls so that we are brave enough and committed enough to act our faith not only here, but out there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I do believe you have a bulletin insert for communion. This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and share in the community of God's people. The Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, on that same day sat at the table with two disciples, who was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, with the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us, and with your daughters and sons of faith in all times, all places, we praise you with joy by saying, Remember that on the night of Jesus' betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the bread.
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the cup. May we now share in the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, who may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. And our hymn of closing is Shalom to you now, which is printed in your bulletin. <laughs> Does anybody, John, do you feel confident? Anybody want to take a shot of Shalom to you now? Any leaders, any choir members? Okay, no, no him then, okay. <laughs> All right, um, moving on from that to our benediction. Let us enter our everyday world, now ready by word and communion for action in the world. Let our lamps of faith shed light and often darken the world. God, whose word alone prepared vast worlds beyond our knowing, welcomes us as covenant partners in the work of continuing creation and regeneration. Let us work together for justice and peace where we live. Let our prayers hold up those in need and our work help them to feel the hand of God lifting them up. Let us therefore go forth to love and serve the Lord in all we do among all whom we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this point, how about this, uh, the uh, congregation responses? Anybody want to lead that or no? Yes? Okay, we're going to give a shot to go now with you.